crouching in the phone booth, our ears alert, Guy and I started staring at each other in horror. On our minds was exactly the question Dina Wentworth asked next. Bob, how do you know Tony was one of the rock throwers? I know it for sure, Bob said earnestly. He quickly told her the story he told Sheila and me the day the restroom signs were switched. That he'd been driving on the freeway south of the city and had seen a couple boys throwing rocks and that he turned their license number into the police. And they were caught, he told Mrs. Wentworth. The other boy had a longest record, so they sent him through the court system. Tony didn't have any records, so he went before a citizens conference committee so that he could perform community service work. But how do you know it was Tony? I'm telling you, Tony's dad kicked up a storm. He refused to believe that Tony had any part in it at all. So before they could go any further, the cops called me and asked me if I'd be willing to testify if I had to. Guy and I looked at each other. My hair was prickling on my scalp. If Tony has known all along that it was Mr. Craiglander who testified, I whispered hoarsely. Shh, Guy hissed. So one night they asked me to come down to the bank in the area, Mr. Craiglander continued. They'd called Tony before a committee in one of the conference rooms there, and they had me wait outside in case I had to testify. There was a short pause, then Mr. Craiglander said in a different and more cheerful voice, Yes, a little more water, please. That's great. That's enough. Then another pause, and he continued in low tones. I waited there a long time in the dark lobby. I could hear voices from inside, sometimes loud ones. Finally, the door opened, and one of the committee members came out. Beyond him, inside the conference room, it was very bright, and I saw Tony sitting at a table with some other people. You're sure it was him? I'm absolutely sure, said Mr. Craiglander earnestly. Because I was in darkness, my view through the door was like a movie scene, sharp and bright. You know that little mole on his left cheek? That showed up perfectly. There's no doubt that it was him. So then you went in and testified. No, I didn't. A committee member had come out to tell me that Tony had finally confessed and that I wasn't needed. Did Tony see you through the door? Impossible, Mr. Craiglander said. He was in a bright room and I was in a dark room. The door was open for only two or three seconds. If he saw anything at all, it would have been my silhouette. Nothing more. I furiously began taking notes in my sketchbook. Mrs. Wentworth asked, Does Tony know that you know him? There's no way he could know. I'd seen Tony around here, but I hadn't gotten close enough to him to recognize him until that morning when poor Polly's pantry was vandalized. He came over to help, and he struck up a conversation with me. Suddenly, I had the vague idea I'd seen him somewhere before. Then he happened to mention that until just recently, he'd been living down south of town. In that same area, the rock-throwing incident had happened, and suddenly it all clicked in my mind. Do you think he suspects? I doubt it. Like I said, there was no way he could know about me. Once I decided it was him, I turned the talk to other things. Bob, this is very awkward for me. You know that. Why would it be awkward? His mother works for me, right here at the cafe. And his sister does too, on a as-needed basis. Oh, oh, I see what you mean. And now, said Mrs. Wentworth, he has applied for the night security guard job. But isn't he underage for that kind of thing? I don't think so, if it merely involves surveillance, and he wants to do it part-time. He's going to take computer training at a community college during the day. Well, 
Just tell him you're sorry, but you need a full-time person. Mrs. Wentworth sighed. He'll be disappointed. And so will Pauline. Speaking as a Hamlet merchant, Bob Craiglander said gently, I'd have to protest strongly if you hired him. In my book, he's just like an ex-con. I mean, would you really feel safe if Mother Brown's was being guarded by a kid who threw rocks from a freeway overpass? Stunned, Guy and I went to my office in ye old bookstore. Shut the door tight, I said as I turned on the gooseneck lamp. There's a lock on it, too. See if you can get it to work. When we felt secure, I turned to the sketchbook page where I'd started writing about Tony. Made a few more notes and put a star in one corner, then drew a circle around it. Well, what's that mean? asked Guy. It means Tony's our main suspect now. Maybe, but maybe not, too. Why not? It's starting to fit together. He's got means, motive, and opportunity. He's got what? The guy asked. I was reading a police officer's handbook in one of the bookshelves downstairs. and It says that one of the first steps in discovering who committed a crime is to find out who's got means, motive, and opportunity. What's means? It's what you use to commit the crime. Someone holds up a 7-Eleven store with a gun, the gun is the means. Well, the guy said thoughtfully, I suppose he could have gotten hold of some black spray paint somewhere. But anyone, anybody else could have done it. Remember that computer banner at Agape? Tony wants a part-time job so that he can study computers during the daytime. He might already have knowledge to run a banner program. It doesn't take a computer expert to run one of those. I can run the one on the back at our school. And you know I'm no computer whiz. Guy got up and started out the dust, stared out the dusty window pane. So he's got the means. Right. Let me list all the crimes so far. Began writing. Restroom signs. Mark, you forgot the stolen purse. He turned suddenly and came back to the desk. Tony couldn't have taken the purse. He didn't get into town until several hours after the purse was stolen. When it comes to the purse, he's as clean as Sheila is. That's true, I admitted. But let's go down through the rest of the list. Restroom signs, they were switched after he got here. Banner, he's interested in computers. But where would he get a computer? Do the Staffords have one? No, Guy said. Sheila told me Tony wants to buy one when he gets some money. No computer, I said, making a note. That's a snag, or maybe not. Maybe he strolled into one of the computer labs at the community college he's planning to go to. At the college where my dad teaches, it would be the simplest thing in the world to wander into the computer lab and make a banner, especially if you brought your own software with you. I fold around on those computers myself. A lot of them you don't even need passwords for. Well, maybe, said Guy doubtfully. But what about those two other things you said a suspect needs to have? Motive and opportunity. That's it. Now, motive is why you do it, right? Right. Then how, he asked me, can we pin any of this on Tony at all? What motive does he have for causing trouble here at Hamlet? I shrugged. Why did he throw rocks on, th on the freeway? What motive did he have for that? Expect, except to cause mischief. Maybe he just gets a kick out of doing things that make other people afraid. Sort of like an arsonist. Tony's not like that, Guy said in disgust. How do you know? Mark, you played Dutch Blitz with him the other night. You were his partner. Did he seem like a bad guy to you? No, I admitted. But we saw him at a party. He was in a good mood. Maybe... 
he's just got this vendetta against people. Like some kids can never get along with teachers or police officers. Maybe he's got a chip on his shoulder. That's what we've got to find out. Two days later, we discovered the clue that set us on the road to the truth. 